All right. Um, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about my project today. This is a recently submitted project, um, and uh, it's about predicting enhancers using supervised hidden Markov models. Um, so first, a few words about the motivation why we want to do this. And to start with this, I want to uh, tell you what we what our view of an enhancer basically is. So when we talk about an enhancer, what we mean is that we actually have a central uh, accessible stretch of DNA in the chromatin that uh, is providing transcription factor binding sites to uh, transcription fa factors that in turn um, activate co-activators and recruit mediator complex, which in some bring the enhancer region in close proximity to a promoter and thereby uh, regulate uh, gene expression of a target gene. Uh, but we also think that these regions are very heterogeneous, so they don't only exist of this central accessible stretch, but they also have flanking nucleosomes that exceeded certain uh, histone modifications, and typically we would expect uh, K27 acetylation or K4 monomethylation, whereas at uh, promoters we would rather expect this uh, K4 to be trimethylated. Uh, why are we interested in enhancers? Just a very basic slide, because it's uh, interesting in, for many fields of, of um, uh, uh, studies, for example, uh, developmental genetics, where we are interested in the spatial temporal expression of genes. Uh, we also know that many diseases are linked to mutations uh, in non-coding uh, regions uh, and many other fields. Um, and this is also why we are obviously not the first ones that, that try to uh, solve this problem uh, only computationally. And uh, existing methods basically group into unsupervised and supervised methods where um, unsupervised methods, they basically just try to recover uh, patterns from data that we present uh, and then do not uh, assume any prior biological knowledge. Uh, this, but this also means that, we, that this would require the user to interpret any um, predictions. And one of the most famous examples here, is, uh, which you probably all know, is chrome HMM, which is a hidden Markov model that uh, just learns patterns from, from the data and the user then needs to uh, yeah, pre um, take or um, uh, select the states that, that uh, present enhancers, which in some cases might not be trivial. Uh, in case of supervised methods, uh, they usually rely on uh, labeled tr uh, training sets. Um, uh, so we need to have some sort of uh, understanding uh, or a subset of, of enhancers where we are sure that they are enhancers. And what we, we have seen that such methods often assume homogeneity within enhancers. And this kind of contradicts with uh, our understanding of these very heterogeneous regions, so, which is why we uh, came up with the goal of using a supervised approach that incorporates the prior bi biological knowledge um, into a, a dynamic model that is able to detect heterogeneous enhancers of variable sizes. All right, uh, so how does the method work? Uh, we called it EHMM, which stands for Enhancer Hidden Markov Model. And what it basically does is that for certain regions of interest, we use these four features, so these three histone modifications that I talked about before, and additionally a, a, a tag seek that gives us information about chromatin accessibility. And then we would go ahead and bin this, these regions in 100 base pair bins, where at each uh, point we have a feature vector, a four-dimensional feature vector, and uh, for a certain region of interest, we have a sequence of, of observations. Uh, and the hidden Markov model then uh, is used to determine the underlying hidden states that give rise to these observations, uh, most likely. And in our case, we would like them to represent nucleosomes or accessible regions or backgrounds. And the unique character of, of the method is uh, the transition um, uh, matrix. So this is the Markov. Uh, the Markov chain uh, of the model, and basically, if the model is in a background state, it can only leave this background state towards either the enhancer submodel or the promoter submodel by doing this in a directed fashion. So it would have to leave towards the first nucleosome state, then a state representing accessibility, going to a second nucleosome and back to the background, and you can see that back transitions are not allowed. Also, going directly from the background to an accessible region is not allowed. And by this, we try to recover this molecular structure that we uh, think of uh, when we think about enhancers. 
All right, so how do we train um, the methods? Well, we do this independently for promoter and enhancer, and the training sets that we use for enhancers are coming from the SANM5 consortium, which is basically, a, um, they define the enhancers based on bidirectional transcription, um, and for promoters we use uh, annotations based on, uh, from UCSC. Um, and then we go ahead and learn a five-state uh, hidden Markov model on, this, on these regions. And uh, so these are the emission parameters of, uh, of this learned model. And we go ahead and we select the states that uh, are most likely representing accessibility. So in this case, we have states four and five that have a strong attack seek probability but low um, uh, histone marks. And in turn, states one and three, for example, um, look a lot, a lot like uh, what we think uh, enhanced nucleosome should, should look like. We do the same for the promoter model, but obviously here we concentrate on the uh, trimethylation, and we then also learn a 10-state model on uh, randomly selected background regions, and we put this all together in a, in a big model consisting of these 22 states. We also duplicate the nucleosome states, and in between we squeeze the accessibility states so that we have this Kind of, so this is the transition matrix, and you can see that once you are in a first nucleosome of an enhancer, it can either stay here or it can uh, transition forward to, to a state representing accessibility, but all the other uh, blank space tells you that uh, all other transitions are forbidden here. All right, uh, how well does this work? Um, we first uh, applied this to three different uh, cell types, mouse embryonic stem cells, liver and lung. Um, and we do this within a cell type. These are the blue lines where we do cross-validation. Um, but we also try to train a model on uh, embryonic stem cells and apply it to liver and lung. And these are the green and orange curves, which are with or without normalization. And you can see that this basically works within and across samples pretty well. We also go ahead and... Uh, uh, com uh, compare us to existing methods. So one method that we focused on was, uh, was reptile. This is a random forest method that's right now pretty much the top performing method that's out there um, and as a competition for, for supervised methods. We, we also compare ourselves to EPICSEC and Chrome HMM, which are unsupervised in Markov models. And so the first thing that you can see is uh, that we basically, so the two supervised methods basically uh, outperform the unsupervised methods. So this shows the benefit of uh, supervision. Um, but we can also see that we basically recover the performance of reptile pretty much. Uh, when we use the method to uh, do whole genome predictions, we have a very conservative set, set of about 5,500 enhancers in mouse embryonic stem cells. And what you can see here is a set of features that we looked at, so summary features. The first row is basically what we train the model on, so this looks very uh, uh, what we would expect, like a high K4 monomethylation in enhancers, high trimethylation in promoters. But we also see, for example, these three lineage-specific transcri transcription factors peaking mostly in enhancers, which goes along with the idea that we have, that the enhancers are basically more lineage-specific than, than promoters generally. Um, we also see other um, uh, typical enhancer marks, uh, such as CDZF and P300, uh, peaking mainly at enhancers, and then POL2, low DNA methylation, and high sequence conservation, mainly at uh, promoters, but also a little bit in, at enhancers. So this all goes along with what we uh, can read in literature, and was basically reassuring that what we find genome-wide is also meaningful. All right, so this is my last data slide. Um, this shows basically the advantage of the tool um, compared to existing methods. And on the left side here, we, um, I show the distance distributions from predictions based by EHMM or reptile to the next ataxic peak. And we can basically see that uh, EHMM is very, very accurate. So um, the distribution um, centers on around 40 base pairs and uh, Reptile has a median of about 300, so we are much, our predictions are much closer to what is actually the functional entity of, of, a, of a predicted enhancer. Um, and when we look at the distance for, from the two um, uh, tools, 
to the next annotated TSS, we can see that they distribute very uh, similarly, but that uh, in Reptile we have this additional hunch at about 1 KB, which is very close to uh, annotated TSS. And what we think this is, or what we have seen also in, uh, when we looked at uh, uh, examples in the genome browser, is that we, when we have a promoter, we have usually very uh, sharp K4 trimethylation peaks. And once these peaks uh, um, uh, are depleted on the sides, there is K4 monomethylation reemerging, which kind of looks like an enhancer, but ob obviously still belongs to the same uh, attack seek peak, so to, to, to the same functional entity. And reptile is very often fooled by these uh, peaks, whereas we uh, since, since EHMM respects the molecular, molecular structure, uh, it's is, is not going to predict uh, enhancers there. So on that note, I want to uh, close and summarize that uh, EHMM act accurately predicts regulatory elements within and across samples, and that we qualitatively outperform META uh, by performing, uh, providing a high spatial accuracy, um, a high resolution by having nucleosome and accessibility states, and a high level of interpretability. And um, we provide the uh, method at my GitHub page, and you're very welcome to use it. Um, also, if you're working with uh, human data, for example, um, since we have this normalization step involved, uh, this should perform pretty well. All right, uh, on that note, I want to thank my supervisor, Martin, um, obviously, again, the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak, and you, the audience, for your attention. Thank you. Okay, I have a quick question. So um, you showed in, the, in your comparison to the other methods, um, the evaluations were through uh, various AU, ROC kind of curves, um, and uh, you know, I could see that the results were improved. What would be the most stark example of one enhancer that's predicted by uh, EHMM, which is poorly predicted by the, the comparator method, and what do you think characterized that misprediction? You know, so wh what really, I, I understand that your training with the, you know, the approach is different, and your notion of a tra the training set defines what you're looking for, right? So in that sense, there is a conceptual difference. In terms of the actual predictions, you know, uh, uh, how much evidence do we have that the, the strongest um, predict, prediction that was not predicted by the comparator is really what everyone should be calling an enhancer. Yeah. Um, so I haven't uh, uh, really looked at this uh, quantitatively, but I don't think that we have a lot of positive uh, predictions that many other uh, methods don't predict. I think it's more the other way around. Like we reduce uh, false positives to, to, a, to a high amount. This is also the last slide that I showed where we actually see that we have some uh, so first of all, we are accurate, but also this, this kind of additional peak close to the promoters where we refrain from calling them enhancers. And you also often see that when you use Chrome HMM, for example, that you have a lot of enhancers actually, these states border directly to a promoter state, which is the question, like, obviously you have promoters that can act as enhancers, but um, often we have methods that call them both, and which doesn't necessarily mean that this is a, a, a correct prediction. And in our case, we try to refrain from calling this an enhancer and, and be more conservative about it, basically. Okay. So the, um, the question that Saurabh just asked, the, um, is that because you improve at the near promoter peaks at distinguishing them from promoters? because your spatial resolution of the methyl-3 is better than chrome HMM? Um, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily only the spatial resolution. Uh, I think by having also a promoter submodel, we would then probably more likely call it a promoter. And since this accessibility, this ataxic peak is then already covered by a promoter prediction, we, this wouldn't be available for another enhancer prediction.